Hi, and welcome to the Dr. Carl Callender Visiting Writer Series here at Brookdale Community College. My name is Suzanne Parker. I am a professor in the English department, and I direct our creative writing program. Today, I am thrilled to be speaking with Topaz Winters, the author of three collections of poetry, most recently, The Wonderful So Stranger, and also uh, a chapbook. So, Topaz, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thanks. So, you, you're 23. I am indeed. And, and you make me feel like a complete slacker. <laughs> you have published three collections of poetry. Again, most recently, So Stranger, mm -hmm. which is incredible. And you have a chapbook, which I think I read has been downloaded over 15,000 times. 30,000, yeah. Oh, oh my God, that, those are rock star numbers. <laughs> Nobody you. gets that in the poetry <laughs> community. And you're 23. How, when did this all, how did this all start for you? Um, so I started kind of writing seriously, writing professionally when I was about 13 years old. Um, and that just started, I had a little blog that I wrote on every single day, and then in order to kind of fund this blog, um, I was writing uh, freelance and kind of copy editing. Um, this is at 13? Yes, I was 13. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I was doing that, and then uh, when I was 15, I started a publishing house, and so that As was one really... does at 15. <laughs> Uh, it was very much something I didn't think it was going to last past two years, and mm -hmm. it's been almost ten now, which is crazy. Um, but that really was kind of the moment that I started branching out into kind of thinking about what publishing could be um, as a career for me. Um, Have Know This, like you mentioned, which was my first chapbook, came out when I was 16, and that did better than I could have imagined. Um, and I think it was... I think it was really what I needed to write at the time, and luckily it was also what a lot of people needed to read at the time, mm -hmm. um, and we just went from there. Yeah, you've written about, um, or talked about that originally there had not been a large community available to you, but that you found community online. Mm -hmm. um, what role did that play for you? Is it still important to you, that online community? Very much so. I think that, I, mean, I grew up in Singapore, mm -hmm. um, which is, um, I think lately um, we've had a much more thriving poetry community and artistic community in general, and that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. But at least when I was younger, I didn't really have access to that. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't. I went to an international school. I wasn't really involved in the kind of Singaporean culture as it was, mm -hmm. um, and so I didn't really have access to poetry um, as uh, a really like living, breathing mm -hmm. uh, community force. And so I did turn to the internet um, to kind of look for those communities and build those communities. Um, my first book came out when I was 17 and that was really when I started. It was with the Singaporean Press and that was when I really started um, becoming much more invested in my local community um, uh -huh. and understanding kind of the possibility of uh, what was present, what was available there. Yeah, and then so Half Mystic. Now this is mm -hmm. the name of the publishing house and journal, is that correct yes. as well too? Mm -hmm. um, so you, the, I love the give back. You, you began mm -hmm. and the online community gave you, it opened your eyes a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to possibilities. And now you're giving back by creating this creative space mm -hmm. for others. Um, you wanna talk about that? Tell us kind of what it centers on, what its projects are. Yeah, Half Mystic is like my favorite thing I've ever made. Um, <laughs> it's it truly makes me so happy to like think about how far we've come. Um, so it's an independent publishing house and mm -hmm. literary journal dedicated to the celebration of music in all its forms. Mm -hmm. um, and I started the project because I was thinking about um, I was a really really big musician until I was about fifteen, and I was mm -hmm. diagnosed with an illness that essentially meant I couldn't play music anymore. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about how I could kind of remain invested in musicality. Um, in a way that was not actually kind of physically playing it. Um, mm -hmm. And I was thinking a lot about how a lot of the journals that I was submitting to, a lot of the journals that, that I was reading, <coughs> were kind of focused on um, sort of straight literature. Mm -hmm. um, and my work has always been interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary and kind of existing within the borders of art forms. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was kind of thinking, how do we make this project that is not one thing or another, but that opens space for possibility um, and, and creates room in between kind of the genres and the borders that we've kind of arbitrarily set. Mm -hmm. When I look on the uh, website, which I urge everybody, Half Mystic, is it dot com? <laughs> Half Mystic .com, yes, <laughs> <laughs> To check out. Um, there's a lot of art, too. Mm -hmm. And was that important to you? Yes, very much so. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. Um, when I think of this though, um, so in not being able to perform music anymore or create music, um, you found another way to be mm -hmm. in that space. When that sort of receded a little bit, did your writing and poetry move forward? 
Did that take place? Its place? Yeah, I think so. Um, I was. I would call myself kind of both a poet and musician up until the time I was about 15. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, once, like you said, once the music receded, it, I did feel like I needed to do something mm -hmm. um, to sort of fill that energy and, and use that and harness that work that I put into that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was lucky because I had something else um, and mm -hmm. I didn't really have to search um, for something else to, to be a creative outlet. Um, mm -hmm. I did have writing and I have written a lot about that illness and mm -hmm. my illnesses in general and kind of how um, my relationship with, with music has changed over the course of the eight years um, since that diagnosis came to me. Um, yeah. And so for me, writing is a way of accessing the space that music once gave me, um, however mm -hmm. temporarily. Nice, nice. Yeah, and so, so you have Half Mystic <laughs> and then you have your publishing history. Um, you're also a student at Princeton. Yes. Finishing up this year, and if I um, saw correctly, are you co-directing the what is it the Songline Slam team? So I actually left the team last year. Oh, okay. Um, just because there was so much on my plate. Sure. Um, but I'm doing a ton of shows off campus, which has been really lovely, and I'm still yeah. working at the um, Office of Disability Services, which is another really big passion of mine. Gotcha. I, I guess I'm interested in as somebody who on the elevator down here, you told me was a page poet. Um, <laughs> why you started getting interested in performance poetry or slam poetry, how have they fed each other, do they feel very different, what your relationship is in that performative medium? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's one that I'm... I think it was like five, actually. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> feel free to pick the one you want to answer. <laughs> um, I like all of them. I feel like they're all kind of feeding into this greater kind of identity that I'm kind of creating for myself, uh -huh. um, where... I grew up not as a performer. Um, mm -hmm. That was not that was never kind of an identity that I had. Um, I had very severe anxiety growing up, um, mm -hmm. and so a lot of my writing was a way to not be seen. Um, mm -hmm. And when actually, I think really the tide started turning when my first book came out, and I did start accessing that really beautiful, vibrant poetry community in Singapore that I didn't even know existed beforehand. And a lot of that community centers around slam and performance. Mm -hmm. um, and I was never a big performer, but I started understanding what performance could do that maybe a sort of poem on the page could not do or mm -hmm. what it could do differently. Um, what, what can it do differently then, would you say? It can reach people who might not necessarily think of themselves as consumers of poetry. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one of the poems that really changed my perspective on poetry is Patricia Smith's Skinhead. Um, which, like, we love Patricia Smith here. Yes. <laughs> um, that was one of the first like kind of slam mm. poems I ever saw, and it just like twisted something. Um, mm. And so I was in this, I was in these communities. I was kind of watching these videos online, um, and I started to kind of think about what would my performance look like. Um, and I think, like you mentioned, I started on the page, that's the pages where I'm comfortable. Um, and you've read a lot of my work, it really does center around what the page can do that the stage cannot, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that is visual. Yeah. Um, but my background is in music, and so I really believe that um, music can both exist on the page and also within the space of the performance and the space of the room. Um, and so I kind of started, I guess, training myself to be a performer, um, and I never, thought that I would kind of be in that position mm -hmm. um, and that I had a lot of really amazing opportunities to perform once I got to the U.S. Um, and that kind of culminated on, in the tour that I went on uh, this past summer, which was really like, I think like three straight weeks of performing. And that was really tough on me, uh, but it was also so exciting. Gotcha, gotcha. That makes perfect sense with your music background, though, mm -hmm. as well, too. So what is the process for you for writing a poem? Um, I know Mark Doty talks about it all begins with an image, mm -hmm. you know. What does it begin with and what's your process like? Or do you have one? <laughs> um, I think my relationship with the process has changed a lot over the past couple of years um, because it has become my job um, and that's really beautiful and, you know, more than a lot of folks um, could hope for and I am cognizant of that every day. But also, um, I always think about my relationship with a poem as a trust exercise where I need to trust the work before mm -hmm. I try and force it to come out before it's ready. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really believe in the poem as an organism and as a living thing. Um, and I believe that the poem has its own wants and needs and like 
will come out of me if it wants to and when it wants to and, the, and in the form that it wants to. And once it does, it's not really my job to um, try and force it to be something different. Um, I always think about um, my editor, Joshua Bennett, who uh, edited So Stranger, um, has something that he talks about a lot where are you trying to serve the poem or are you trying to serve your ego? Um, and I, as a writer, I think all of us as writers, um, tend <laughs> well, to serve our egos. Egos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and so for me, it has really been a process of mm -hmm. what does the poem want? What is the poem trying to say? Mm -hmm. Even if that's different than what I am necessarily trying to say. Gotcha, gotcha. Oh, I love that, that idea of getting, I, I talk to my students about, like, ideally, the poem is driving the car. Like, Absolutely. I want to take my hands off the steering wheel. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even want to be there. I want to be drinking <laughs> coffee at the rest stop. Um, Kwame Daz has that great um, blog on the Poetry Foundation mm -hmm. talking about writer's block mm -hmm. and saying, yeah, you know, I used to say there was no such thing as writer's block. But then he was saying, you know, sometimes I just got nothing to write about <laughs> or I'm bored. And they're like, that's okay, too. That's okay, too. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel that way? Absolutely. I think the silence is poetry. Yeah, yeah, nice and sad. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're actually going to have to take a short break. Um, so we'll be right back. Um, please join us, folks. I'm talking to Topaz Winters, and we'll see you after the break. Thanks. Brookdale Community College, the power to provide accessibility to over 60 degree and certification classes on campus and online, to provide a rich community of faculty and student life, to provide affordability through financial aid, scholarships, and grants. Brookdale Community College, the power to provide you the access, affordability, and community to reach your education goals. Brookdale Community College. Do you love films? Do you want to make films? Do you want to be in films or do you just want to watch films? Then the Filmmakers Club is for you. Here to learn more about it are all of these amazing film members. How are you guys doing? Great. Good. Who wants to tell me about this club? We are the Brookdale Filmmakers Club. We specialize in the filmmaking process. We teach people how to make movies. We teach them how to act in films. We teach them how to write, how to edit, and how to direct. What do you guys love most about the club? You look so enthusiastic. Let's hear about this club. I just love meeting all these great guys over here just filming some movies. I, I, just, I just love it all, man. That's so great. Can anyone join in if they want to be a writer, if they want to be an actor, a director, anyone who who wants to work in film can just join? Anyone can join. Anyone who has an interest in making movies, writing movies, anyone can join. We especially need more women to join the club. Yeah. To learn more about Filmmakers Club or any of these clubs, please visit brookdalecc.edu. Women, join. Just a college student. I'm a marathon runner, a volunteer and a philanthropist. I'm an employee. I'm a future master's degree holder. I believe the path to a better world is paved with a million small steps. Thanks to Brookdale, I'm already halfway there. My name is Killian Warman, and I came to Brookdale to explore my passions. I never imagined I'd have the flexibility to pursue them all. I went to college right after high school, but it didn't work out. After a few years in the workforce and the birth of my son, I decided to give college another try. At Brookdale, something clicked. I met amazing professors and found a major I was passionate about. I made the Dean's List, landed a great internship, and now I'm pursuing my bachelor's degree. Thanks to Brookdale, I have what it takes to see my dreams through. I'm Tara Boyce, and I came to Brookdale to give college another try. I never imagined I would find my passion. Hi, and welcome back to the Dr. Carl Callender Visiting Writer Series show. My name is Suzanne Parker, and I am here today with the absolutely marvelous and accomplished young poet, Topaz Winters, whose new book is called So Stranger and is out recently from Button Poetry. So welcome back. Thank you. I'd hoped you'd read a poem for us, so would you? Certainly. Thanks. Um, this is Ars Poetica 6. I promise I had better things to say than this. But we can start with the poetry. I love you like a midsummer night. Okay. I'm tired of making conversation. Logic is so boring. Let's pour another glass of wine. Let the mind stain into vapor. Every secret is the same secret. How about I love you in the way good people kill spiders who do them no harm? Better. Once 
A friend showed me a tarot card with a fish jumping out of a young man's cup, back into the sea. In most decks, she said, the fish is still in the cup. How about, I love you in the way this was once a story about fullness, and now it is a story about loss. No, another glass of wine. Above the sky past midnight, it's astonishment and ventricles. I think about the young man, someone's son, fishless and hungry, the fact of him, void of any shadow. Even so, I think this story is not about a young man and the things he's lost. I think it is about a fish, someone's daughter, and the choices she's made. The sea, someone's mother, and the way she takes the unrecognizable and gives it form. How about I love you in the way some things will never forget what is theirs. It's poetry. Who cares if it makes sense? Before we both woke up, you said to me, I swear I am the young man, not the fish, not the sea, not the empty cup. I swear to you, I am human. Believe me, please. And I did. And I do. Thank you so much. Of course. Well, that was read like somebody who's been performing for a very long time. <laughs> That's gorgeous. Um, I'm so glad you read the Ars Poetica because mm -hmm. the book is in, chap in sections mm -hmm. and each one begins with an Ars Poetica. Um, did you have that in mind to begin with? How did you arrive at that? So I did not have it in mind to begin with. I think that when I started conceptualizing this book, it, it was a story about what it means to be an immigrant, but mm -hmm. more specifically, a story about the immigrant story. Um, and I was thinking a lot about, I think there's been so much discourse around like the immigrant narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that really interesting as someone who um, grew up in kind of three places at once um, mm -hmm. and uh, has this like really, this lineage that is really deeply important to me. Um, and also in many ways um, has been kind of stripped from that story because I am not American, I didn't grow up in America. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was thinking about like how we tell stories and what, it, what does it mean to be an immigrant? What does it mean to be a daughter? What does it mean to be an artist? And kind of those three identities were really kind of shifting in my mind. Um, and so I started writing this book, I think probably around um, 2018. Mm -hmm. um, and late in that year, I sort of became obsessed with this idea of, of an Ars Poetica. And what does it mean for an immigrant to write an Ars Poetica? And what does it mean for an immigrant to go to a new country and build a story and build a poem out of the country that they have found? Um, mm -hmm. And how does kind of language factor into that poem? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if you sort of inhabit a language that is not your own, if you inhabit a country that is not your own, if you inhabit a body that is not your own, um, what poem do you build out of that? Uh, mm -hmm. And so to me, the series of Ars Poeticas is kind of inseparable from the immigrant narrative and the dissection and the discussion and the mm -hmm. unearthing of that immigrant narrative. Um, and it's also inseparable from sto the story about my family, um, mm -hmm. especially as someone who grew up in a family that doesn't really tell our stories. Um, to kind of hunt down those stories very intentionally and sit with them um, and uh, kind of build this family lineage that I never really had access to growing up. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that felt inseparable from the story I was telling about myself as an artist. The father, there's a father figure who, yes. who shows up a lot in this, um, which I thought was really interesting. Um, did you, it sounds like you sat down with a concept for the book, or is that a little too? I don't think I ever sit down with a concept for a book. I think that I start writing some poems and I'm like, wow, there's something here. Gotcha. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the book kind of forms itself in that way. And then once there is sort of this collection of not quite finished concepts, mm -hmm. um, from there I start thinking about, okay, what is the story that this overarching um, series is trying to tell? Gotcha. Now your work um, tackles some really important themes. Um, many of which 20 years ago would have been even things that were not written a lot about, you know, chronic illness, mental illness, um, queerness, the, the female body, the immigrant experience, homophobia, racism, um, trauma and recovery. Um, particularly the, the previous book, my gosh, um, My Body is a Crime that I 
am still committing. Close. Portrait of my body is a oh, kind shoot. of still committing. <laughs> shoot, it's such a good title, but it's a hard it's one absurd. to memorize. Yes. <laughs> I was not really thinking practically. Looked at the body, the, the bodies of water, the female body, yes. the gaze on the female body, the body of desire, mm -hmm. just kind of in all these different ways. Um, these are subjects that some people might shy away from. Um, do you ever feel at risk or uncertain about, do I want to put this out there? more so in recent years. Um, I think when I was growing up, really a lot of my platform came from how openly I read about stuff like illness and the body and mm -hmm. um, moving through the world in a body that the world doesn't always like. Um, mm -hmm. Lately, people have just gotten very loud um, and that is both beautiful because it means that I'm reaching more people, but also um, in many ways it's very scary um, because mm -hmm. there is like this kind of layer of vulnerability um, that is just kind of exposed to the world that I can't really take back. Um, and so I've been doing a lot of coming to terms with um, what I shared with the world when I was kind of too young to know better. Um, mm. Or at, at the time, I think when I was sharing that stuff, it did feel like this very intentional choice. And, um, you know, I'm 23, I'm not like ancient. Um, but uh, even so, I think I have a lot of compassion for the self that I was when I kind of made that decision to put that work in the world and the self that I am now, who is kind of trying to renegotiate the line between what is owed to the world and what I owe to myself to kind of keep private. Mm -hmm. In an interview, and my apologies, I can't remember with whom, you, I loved this phrase. I think it was, I am healing loudly. Mm -hmm. Do you remember saying that? I do, yeah. It's wonderful. Thank um, you. Can you speak about that? Yeah. Um, I think that a lot of, in the place where I came from, a lot of kind of illnesses and a lot of cr chronologies around illness um, come with this story of like, just be quiet. Um, mm -hmm. Like you can be ill, you can be healing, um, you can be at whatever stage in your journey as long as you don't make it my problem. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a really easy narrative, I think, because it is really uncomfortable to be faced with stuff like trauma and stuff like illness. And um, I don't think it's inherently uncomfortable, but I do think that in kind of the societies that we've built, we consider these things to be deeply taboo. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, even, even if you looked at societies that we built in the past, healing and community um, and kind of bringing trauma to the surface were incredible parts of the culture um, and they were deeply integral. And so for me, I think like the idea of healing loudly is this thing of like, I am better than I was, I'm going to make it your problem. Um, and to me, like making it the world's problem mm -hmm. that I'm healing is an assertion for myself that like I deserve to be here and take up space. Mm -hmm. um, no matter what stage of that healing process that I'm in, even if it's something that, even if I'm, in kind of a bad state mentally, I still deserve to be here. Or if I am in an amazing state and the people who are healing with me are not in that space, mm -hmm. I still deserve to be here. Um, and so I think for me, it's this idea of like the defiance against quiet. Mm -hmm. um, I want my work to be anything but quiet. <laughs> um, I think that should be on t-shirts and bumper stickers. I am <laughs> healing loudly. I absolutely love it. Um, the poet Patricia Smith, who I know you admire, and we love Patricia Smith over here, um, she has talked about giving voice to those who cannot, particularly in um, connection with incendiary art, um, her amazing previous book, um, where she talked about there's always that mother behind the microphone in some tragedy that has occurred you know, with a man of color. And you know, what is she saying? We never get to hear from her again. And she talks about looking to see who are we not hearing from, and, and that being important, to give voice. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that? I think in some ways, yes, but I also think that for me, the real work is not necessarily in drawing those voices out, but rather in giving those spaces, th those voices, sorry, a place to come out on their own. Um, mm -hmm. I think that it's a very tricky line, I think, because a lot of folks who are in those positions of marginalization and vulnerability simply don't feel the need or don't necessarily want to share their stories. And I think that's also a very kind of valuable point of view. I think that not all stories are meant for the world. Um, but what I do think is important and what I try to do with Half Mystic and what I try to do with kind of my work as a whole is 
allow for spaces where if people want, they can kind of come out and share their stories mm -hmm. um, and allow for spaces uh, that are not just kind of dominated by um, the story that we hear over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I'm always kind of trying to trying to find a balance between because mm -hmm. at least for me there was a lot of stuff that I was not ready to write about um, when I was younger and there's a lot of stuff I'm still not ready to write about now mm -hmm. um, and that stuff is important and I think that if I did end up sharing that work with the world it would help a lot of people but it wouldn't help me mm -hmm. um, and so I think the first part of community care is also asking the community members what they actually need and sometimes what they need is um, to keep their stories for themselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not, but just giving the option, I think is really important. Wonderful. Well, we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, what do you hope people take from So Stranger? Or do you not have a hope? Do you hope that they all create their own meaning out of it? I think, I don't know. I think that with this book, what I was really trying to do was tell the story of this creation myth um, of this person who is from everywhere and nowhere at once. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I'm really hoping what readers take from it is the idea that distance and arrival can be synonyms. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of like where we are is not necessarily where we're going. It can also be where we came from. Um, I, I think that especially what I want this book to do is mm -hmm. serve as um, this point of kind of liminality between um, these two worlds where I think sometimes we can think of the place we came from as a place to leave behind um, and the place we're going as kind of the dream, the American mm -hmm. dream one might say. Um, and so what I want this book to be is a reminder that it doesn't have to be one or the other, like we can have both. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, that would be wonderful. <laughs> um, it has been such a pleasure speaking with you, Topaz. Is there a new book coming out in the next year? You've been very kicked <laughs> out. Or are you just going to graduate from Princeton for a while? <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And thank you, folks, for watching. Again, the book is called So Stranger by Topaz Winters. Um, check out her website to see everything that she is doing and halfmystic.com. And also please check out more of what Brookdale has to offer in the world of creative writing. We've got a wonderful program here. We've got classes in mixed genre, introductory, poetry fiction, creative nonfiction screenwriting. So if you've got a memoir in you that you're dying to write up, we can help you with that. So please check out all we have to offer and thank you very much for watching.